so after wrought iron uh, there comes the cast iron the cast iron is again it is produced from uh, the uh, pig iron uh, pig iron is remelted in uh, the copula furnace uh, and uh, we get uh, the cast iron uh, it contains uh, 90% iron 2 to 4.5% carbon in cast iron is there 1 to 3% silicon and then a small uh, uh, percentage of sulfur manganese and phosphorus is there now it is its properties are it is very strong but uh, it is brittle in nature okay so it has a relatively low melting point and is it is wear resistant so melting point is less around 1100 to 1200 degree centigrade Uh, but it is uh, wear resistant so wear uh, does not uh, happen uh, quickly on this okay it poses good fluidity fluidity means when we melt a, any metal and we test that uh, how it flows uh, inside uh, the various passages uh, so its fluidity is very good so that is why uh, this cast iron is used for casting uh, sand casting because its fluidity is very good it 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 can flow easily okay uh, it is uh, it has poor ductility so because it is brittle so hence it is uh, not ductile and it has poor malleability also so these properties are missing in cast iron another property of cast iron is that it is a good uh, uh, shock absorber and uh, it absorbs uh, uh, sound also okay shock and sound also so hence it has got a good uh, vibration absorbing property so because of this uh, these uh, properties uh, it is used in the manufacturing of lathe beds and railway tracks because uh, it has good uh, this uh, vibration absorbing capacity so that is why it is a good uh, uh, material for making lathe beds and railway tracks okay plus it is used for making fly wheels and machine frames and columns okay. so these are all the applications of cast iron next is uh, what are uh, steels now steels we have already uh, discussed previously it can be uh, subdivided into low alloy and high alloy steels and low carbon medium carbon and high carbon steels so we will discuss uh, these uh, one by one now steel is what it is an alloy of uh, iron and carbon Uh, which is produced either by uh, there there are two methods of producing steel one is by using the uh, oxygen uh, method in which the oxygen is blown uh, into the pig iron okay <clears throat> and uh, the other process is your electric arc furnace is there uh, in that uh, what we use is so what are the two processes uh, in oxygen steel making process the molten pig iron uh, what we do is we blow oxygen uh, so that the oxidation takes place so various uh, uh, product or various constituents of uh, the uh, pig iron uh, they get oxidized okay and uh, this uh, oxidation it uh, results uh, in uh, lowering the carbon content so when carbon gets oxidized it either forms carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide at higher temperature and it becomes gas and it uh, goes out into the uh, atmosphere so the carbon content uh, of uh, the pig iron it reduces so this is one method of producing steel another method of producing steel is your the electric furnace uh, in this what we use is we use the old steel that is scrap steel or the recyclable steel uh, it is put in the furnace and it is remelted uh, with some other additives uh, and to form the steel so main ingredients or the main composition of steel is around 0.5 to 1.5% of carbon is there and then small amounts of uh, you have silicon manganese sulfur and phosphorus is there so these are the main ingredients of steel okay and again the major uh, constituent is iron okay rest uh, are in a smaller uh, percentage now steel can be again classified into carbon steel alloy steel and tool steel so first we will take up the carbon steel so carbon steel it contains primarily of iron and carbon and small amounts of sulfur magnesium and phosphorus is there so carbon steel can be subdivided into three uh, 
types that is low carbon steel medium carbon steel and high carbon steel in low carbon steel the percentage of carbon is around 0.05 uh, to 0.3% and the rest is iron. Uh, the properties uh, are, it is soft and ductile, good machinability, good toughness, good formability and weldable. Okay. So formability is the property that we can form into any shape. Okay. So that is formability and weldability is the property that it can be welded. So two parts can be welded easily. So that is weldability. Machinability is the property that is, uh, uh, it can be machined into any shape easily. So that is machinability. Okay. Now applications of uh, low carbon steel can be, it is used to make chains, bolts, nuts, keys, uh, boiler plates in uh, structural sections like channels and beams are made up of low carbon steel. After the low carbon steel, the next type of uh, carbon steel is your medium carbon steel or it is, uh, you might have read mild steel is there. So medium carbon steel or mild steel. Uh, in this, uh, the carbon content is from 0.3 to 0.6%, remaining being iron. Uh, the main properties are, it has high tensile strength, improved toughness, toughness is better, uh, good bending strength is there, and it is highly wear resistant. Now medium carbon steel is used uh, to manufacture shafts and gears, connecting rods, Locomotive, uh, the wheels that are used in locomotives, those are made up of uh, uh, medium carbon steel. Then is your rotor shafts. The shafts of uh, the various rotors are made up of medium carbon steel. After the medium carbon steel, we have the high carbon steel. Now in high carbon steel, uh, the carbon content uh, is uh, at the range of 0.6 to 1.5%. 96 to 97% content is of uh, iron and the rest of the particles are like your uh, uh, sulfur, phosphorus, manganese are there in smaller uh, percentage. Now the properties are, it is high resistant to wear and tear. So this high carbon steel, it is, it is a very good wear. It has very good wear resistant properties. Okay. And it does not tear also. High strength, yield strength and low impact strength. Okay. It has high yield strength. This means yield strength is when we, uh, so it, it, it's uh, yield strength is uh, uh, more of a property of a ductile material. So when it is, this material is under a tensile load. Okay. So it can, uh, uh, the maximum yield strength uh, of uh, high carbon steel is very high. Okay. So it can absorb a lot of uh, energy before it's uh, elongation or necking starts. Uh, so you might have uh, seen uh, the uh, stress strain curve. In stress strain curve, the yield strength uh, points are uh, shown. So high carbon steel has very high yield strength, but it has, on the other hand, low impact strength. Okay. Ductility is uh, less than medium carbon steel. So it, it is ductile, but uh, the ductility is less as compared to the medium carbon steel because the carbon content, as we, as we increase the carbon content, uh, the brittleness increases inside the material. So carbon increases the brittleness. Now applications of high carbon steel, it is used in the manufacturing of uh, various steels, uh, chisels and screws. In drill manufacturing, the drill bits that are made of uh, high carbon steel, it is used in the manufacturing of the various lathe tools and reamers, ball bearings and springs. So all these are made up of high carbon steel because it is very high, it has very high wear resistance. So that is why all these parts, you can see they are all uh, uh, subject to wear. So if uh, the material is uh, high uh, wear resistance, so this material is used for all the materials that are used uh, under wear conditions. So this is your high carbon steel. Then comes is your alloy steel. Now alloy steels are produced by adding uh, uh, the different elements uh, other than carbon to improve the properties that are required according to the application. So the principal elements that are uh, added are nickel, magnesium, chromium, silicon, and copper to form different alloy steels. 
now allow, allowing elements are added to improve the properties such as the uh, castability weldability machinability to improve the strength to maintain strength at elevated temperatures okay so what happens is uh, when we increase the temperature of any material uh, it becomes soft okay and the strength of that material decreases now by adding uh, certain materials into the uh, steel so we can uh, increase the strength of that material even at high temperatures elevated temperatures okay other is to improve the corrosion resistance so we know that steels they are highly corrosion resistant that is the corrosion does not take place in steels uh, okay now this the commonly used uh, steels are stainless steel and nickel steel is there now in stainless steel it is a very good uh, corrosion resistant material okay uh, the main consist constituents of stainless steel are apart from carbon uh, 18% chromium 8% nickel and 0.03% carbon is there in stainless steel okay and the rest is majority is iron and small amounts of magnesium silicon and sulfide is there so because this uh, material is very uh, good uh, corrosion resistant material so hence it is uh, used in the manufacturing of uh, the various uh, kitchen equipments or utensils springs and even your shaving blades they are made up of stainless steel then next type of steel is your nickel steel in this step type of steel we add nickel as the alloying element it contains 3% nickel and 0.2 to 0.35% of carbon is there these are used in making your piston rods axles and the various parts of ships are made up of nickel steel so these are the various types of steels we have then the third type of steel is your tool steels now tool steels are uh, special types of steels uh, with the carbon contents that ranges between 0.8 to 1.2% the alloying element uh, used uh, in this is your tungsten vanadium cobalt and chromium a very common example of high is your uh, tool steel is your high speed steel now it contains 0.7% to 0.8% carbon 1 0.2 to 20% tungsten, 3 to 5% chromium, and then other materials in smaller quantities. Now, this two uh, high-speed steel is or tool steel is used to make drill bits, lathe tools, milling cutters, and reamers. So this is your tool steel. There we can make uh, high-strength tool uh, tools uh, to cut uh, or ma machine the various. Uh, materials uh, using your milling or uh, your drill uh, machine or your lathe machine so that is your tool steel is there now after the ferrous materials we have the non ferrous materials now non ferrous materials are those materials that do that do not contain iron in it okay uh, they include strength to weight ratio they have good resistance to corrosion they are lighter in weight uh high electrical and thermal conductivity and they are easily uh, fabricated examples can be your aluminium copper zinc lead tin all these are non ferrous materials so uh, we will discuss about the different materials the non ferrous materials one by one the first is aluminium it is uh, uh, silver silvery in uh, color uh, soft and ductile material in it its ore uh, from aluminium is found as a hydrated aluminium oxide or bauxite is there that is the ore we get from it uh, the aluminium is extracted the various properties are it is light in weight and it is easily work uh, you can work on this or we can machine it or you can work on it very easily okay because it has uh, low uh, hardness okay uh, non magnetic and it is a good reflector of light it has high ductility good electrical and thermal conductivity now due to passivation uh, phenomena uh, it has the ability to resist corrosion so it is corrosion resistant also the main applications uh, first is your metallurgical applications it is used as a deoxidizer in uh, the production of iron and steel electrical industry aluminium is used to make cables motors and rotors aircraft industry 
because it is lighter in weight, uh, it is used uh, in uh, aircraft and automotive industry in the form of aluminum alloys uh, because uh, it is a good resistance, uh, corrosion resistant, and it is lighter in weight and it provides the uh, strength that is uh, equivalent to your uh, ferrous uh, metals. Okay. In packaging industry, we use to make foils and uh, tin cans. In construction industry, we make windows, doors, solar panels, and roofings uh, out of aluminium. So these are the applications of aluminium. Copper is another uh, non-ferrous material. Uh, it comes from the ore. The ore is known as pyrites. Uh, it is extracted from that ore. Uh, it is uh, you. It is extracted in a reverberator furnace. Uh, okay. The main uh, alloys of uh, copper are your brass and bronze. Is there. Uh, I think uh, the bronze is copper and tin, and uh, copper and zinc forms the brass. Okay. So we'll discuss these two alloys also. Uh, the various properties are: it has very high electrical conductivity, very high thermal conductivity, good corrosion resistance, light in weight, and it is highly ductile. Okay. Uh, so applications: copper is used in refrigerators and air conditioners due to high electrical conductivity. Uh, electrical tubes and cables and wires are made up of uh, copper, uh, used in making alloys like brass and bronze, used for making uh, uh, various roofings and uh, the flushing drains. Okay, even in your door uh, handles or knobs it is used copper because it is a good corrosion resistance material. Next is lead. Lead is a soft and malleable uh, metal. It is obtained uh, from an ore called galena. The ore of uh, uh, lead is known as galena. Uh, the various properties of lead are uh, it is soft and malleable. Uh, malleable is that we can uh, draw sheets out of uh, that metal. So if we can make sheets from that metal, it is malleable. Um, if we can make wires uh, from that metal, it is ductile. It has poor tensile strength, okay. high coefficient of thermal expansion, high anti-friction properties, and it can melt very easily. It has low melting temperature. Lead is toxic in nature. Okay. Now application, it is uh, used for manufacturing water pipes due to its corrosion resistant. Uh, it is also used for making bullets. Uh, then uh, it is used for sheathing uh, the materials uh, uh, for from uh, by for high voltage cables okay so uh, high voltage cables uh, so because it has uh, uh, your poor uh, electric uh, conductivity so it is used for uh, shielding uh, materials uh, from uh, high voltage cables okay so if i want to shield a material we uh, normally what we do is we cover that material uh, that is uh, near the high voltage cable with uh, a sheet of lead. So lead uh, it uh, uh, protects that uh, material from the uh, magnetic field of uh, the high voltage cables that are around. Now solders, uh, it solders since it has low melting point, it is used in soldering wire also. For soldering purposes. Now alloys of lead can be, it is solder is there, babbit metal is there, lead alloy made out of uh, lead, uh, antimony, arsenic, uh, lead, uh, antimony alloy is there and lead foils are formed. So these are the various alloys of lead. Next uh, metal is your nickel. Uh, it is uh, a tough silver colored metal extracted from sulfidos. Uh, it is used for putting iron and uh, steel products and vessels. It has good resistance to corrosion, uh, highly ductile, can be easily casted, high melting point, can be drawn into wires. So hence it is, a, because it is a ductile material, so we can draw wires of nickel. Uh, application, it is an alloying element for steel to increase the tensile strength and anti-friction properties. So nickel, what it does is it increases the tensile strength and it also provides anti-friction properties to the material. So this nickel, 
if we add to a metal, uh, it uh, provides a tensile strength and anti friction properties. It is used as a catalyst for many chemical reactions, uh, used in vessels for heating and boiling. Okay, and it is used in your medical equipment also. Now, various alloys of uh, nickel are monal, German silver, uh, nichrome, and haste alloy is there. So, these are the all alloys uh, that are formed from nickel. Next metal is zinc. Zinc is a white metal that can be extracted from zinc sulfide. Now, it, has, it is a uh, good conductor of electricity. Relatively, it has low melting point. It is resistance to corrosion. Good castability is there and it can be recycled. Now, applications, uh, we use uh, zinc for galvanizing. So iron galvanizing sheets, you might have heard uh, in which we uh, put a coating uh, on the iron uh, sheet or steel. Uh, so a thick, thin layer of zinc is uh, introduced on the surface. And this, uh, what it does is uh, this zinc surface, it prevents uh, the metal from corrosion. Okay. So in which what happens is the iron or the she, uh, steel it is dipped in the uh, liquid bath of zinc and then a thin sheet of coating is applied and uh, it makes uh, the surface uh, corrosion free okay now galvanized steel uh, is used for uh, in your automobile parts it is also used for manufacturing of uh, roof covering applications uh, the various alloys of zinc are cadmium zinc alloy magnesium alloy is there, copper zinc alloy is there, lead zinc alloy is there, and iron zinc alloy is there. So these are the various alloys that are used for zinc. So zinc has a good, uh, it uh, gives a good anti-corrosion properties to the material. Next is tin. Again, tin is a silvery white metal obtained from an oxide called tin stone uh, by reverberatory furnace. In reverberatory furnace, we use, uh, uh, we put this, uh, uh, tin uh, stone, okay, and then the tin is extracted from there. The various properties are it is soft, malleable, and ductile. Uh, it is corrosion resistance from water is very good. It has low melting point around 232 degrees centigrade. Tin melts. Applications tin is coated on uh, steel containers for storing food and water. Okay, used uh, for roofing material due to lightweight and corrosion resistance. Alloys of tin can be pewter and Britannia metal. So these are the alloys of tin. Then silver, it is naturally occurring, soft and white metal. It is highly ductile and malleable. Uh, it has the highest electrical and heat conductivity. Thermal conductivity is the highest for silver. Application, it is used in uh, making jewelry and ornaments in coins, currency coins, mirrors, uh, in uh, printed circuit boards, PCBs, we use uh, silver, and it is also used in photograph. Next is gold. Gold is bright, yellow, dense, soft, malleable, and ductile metal properties. It is chemically non-reactive. Uh, it is a uh, good uh, corrosion resistant material. It has a good uh, electricity conductivity. Uh, gold is very expensive because uh, it's uh, used in jewelry. So primary use is in jewelry, used to protect spaceships from X-ray and solar radiation. Okay. So gold uh, sheets or gold coating is done uh, to protect your uh, spaceships from X-rays and solar radiation. Okay. It is also used in making trophies, medals, cups, sports industry. Um, in India, many of these statues of, of uh, gods, they are made up of uh, gold. Uh, it is also used in heat shield, uh, and because it is a good uh, uh, say reflector of solar radiation, so it is used in uh, electronic circuits for heat shielding. So this is the uh, application of gold. Then comes is brass. Brass is a uh, alloy of uh, copper and zinc. Okay. Uh, the various properties are: it has excellent machinability good strength, corrosion resistant. It has good conductivity, okay, both uh, heat and thermal. Uh, it is recyclable uh, and uh, 
the strength at cryogenic temperatures is very good. The applications are it is used in making ornaments, doors, furniture, various electrical components are made of brass, decorative and protective finishing, and in plumbing also. We use brass in plumbing because it is a, a highly corrosion resistant material. So it, that's why it is used in your plumbing also. Bronze is another alloy of copper and tin, uh, extremely malleable and durable, corrosion resistant, good conductor uh, of uh, heat and electricity, tough and ductile. So high toughness, bronze uh, possesses high toughness. Uh, toughness is the property of any material to absorb energy uh, because if, if you put it in uh, say tensile uh, loading okay, and you stretch it okay, so before it actually breaks the amount of energy that it can absorb is very high so hence it is very tough material okay, so it is hard to break under uh, severe loading also so it is uh, the main applications are it is used in ship propellers uh, and submerged bearings so, because it is a, a good corrosion resistance material, so submerged bearings, so all the bearings that are submerged in say water, so submerged bearings, uh, we use uh, bronze uh, bearings okay, in guitars and piano springs, in your bells, medals, door and window frames. So, this is the application of bronze. Uh, next is your uh, the polymers are there polymers are actually the plastics long chains of plastics is there so polymer is made up of uh, two words that is poly and mer poly means many mer means parts so it is a large molecule or uh, macro molecule composed of many repeated subunits so that is why it is polymer from the IUPAC it is your international union of uh, uh, your practicing and applied chemistry, uh, the definition comes from that uh, union uh, that a molecule of high relative molecular mass, the structure of which essentially comprises of multiple repetitions of units derived actually or conceptually from molecules of low relative molecular mass. So, this is the definition of polymer. Now, polymers can be of two types it can be thermoplastics and thermosetting polymers are there. Now, thermoplastics uh, are those uh, plastics or polymers uh, that can be uh, softened by heating and uh, then you can reuse it. Okay. So, this means uh, on heating they get uh, soft, uh, then by applying pressure uh, you can change the shape of that uh, material of uh, say uh, the thermoplastic <coughs> and uh, then again, uh, uh, it can be formed into any shape. Okay. Uh, then, if we want to recycle it, so it can be these can be recycled. So, for recycling, what we do is we will again heat it up and uh, they will again soften up, and you can change the shape into any shape. And uh, applying pressure, you can again reshape it to any desired shape. Okay. The various examples of uh, the thermoplastic polymers uh, can be your polystyrene is there. Okay, polymethyl uh, methacrylate is another compound. PVC is there, polyvinyl chloride, PVC is there, PVC pipes uh, they are formed. So, these all are uh, thermoplastic polymers. Next is your thermosetting polymers. Now, thermosetting polymers, once they are formed into shape and they are cooled, uh, they become permanently hard. And even uh, if you try to again heat it up, they won't melt. Okay. And so this means the thermosetting uh, polymers, they are, uh, they cannot be recycled. Okay, so they, once they are set, uh, they are fully set. The examples can be epoxies are there. The vulcanized rubber is there. Uh, phenolic uh, and uh, polyester resins. These are all thermosetting polymers that are available. Okay, so this is the main difference between your uh, thermoplastics and thermosetting plastics. Next comes is your what are ceramics. Ceramics are generally made up of, uh, they are also known as the clay products. Uh, ceramics, they are inorganic compounds of, uh, they can be metallic and non-metallic elements. Uh, the main examples can be glass, brick, 
spark plug uh, is made up of uh, ceramic material. Mm. Okay. Uh, so ceramics is another uh, definition for a uh, ceramic is a it is a composite material composed of uh, uh, the ceramic and uh, metal materials. So clay and metal, if we mix to make a composite, uh, that composite that is a mixture of clay and uh, your metal is known as ceramic. <laughs> So classification of uh, ceramics uh, can be, uh, they are uh, based on their composition. So ceramics are classified as made up of oxides like aluminum oxide, uh, your, uh, uh, the different oxides of metals are there, different carbides, nitrides, sulfides, and fluorides. So based upon uh, so what we are using, uh, either we are using oxides of metals, we are using carbides of metals, uh, we are using nitrides of metals, so we can have different uh, types of ceramics. Uh, now, based on their application, uh, we can have glass, clay products, refractory materials, uh, abrasive materials, cements, and your advanced ceramic materials. So, this is the, your uh, ceramic materials. So this was uh, the classification of uh, ceramics. Uh, if you look into the first product that is glass, the glass, uh, we all are familiar. Uh, so uh, these are uh, used uh, in making various containers, windows, mirrors, lenses. Uh, they are non-crystalline silicates that contain the various oxides like calcium oxide, uh, your uh, potassium oxide, aluminum oxide is there, sodium oxide is there. So, which influence the glass properties and their color. Now, clay products, uh, you know that the pottery or the pots that we use, we use bricks. Uh, so, or the chinaware, uh, the utensils, they are made up of uh, these clay products or ceramics. Uh, and even your ceramic bricks are uh, made up of uh, this ceramic material uh, that are uh, high temperature resistant uh, materials. So these ceramic bricks are used in your furnaces because they have high uh, resistance to heat. So these are the various, uh, you can see examples of uh, the ceramic products. So we have different types of pottery pots, mugs, uh, even your uh, wash basins, uh, your, uh, these are the electrical uh, uh, equipments that are used uh, that are made up of uh, ceramic materials. So you might have seen uh, the fuse plugs. Uh, so the fuse plugs are also made up of uh, ceramic materials. And uh, your spark plug, you must have seen the spark plug is the material inside the white material that is used in the spark plug. It is made up of a ceramic. Material. Next comes is your composites. So composites uh, are the materials that are uh, made uh, manually uh, that consists of two or more uh, constituents that are combined together at uh, the macroscopic level. Okay. So what we do is we do not melt uh, like in your alloys uh, where we melt two metals and form a alloy. In composites, we just uh, mix two materials uh, and uh, the two materials, they are actually not soluble in each other. Okay. So one constituent uh, of that is known as the reinforcing phase uh, and the other uh, part is known as the matrix phase is there. So we have uh, the uh, epoxy material or uh, that is the fluid that is used, uh, that is known as your matrix. And then uh, inside the matrix, we can uh, add a layer of matrix material. And then we add a layer of uh, the fibers or uh, the flakes um, or the uh, particles, uh, metal particles we can use, metal fibers we can use uh, as a reinforced uh, uh, phase. And then we again adopt a, a put a, another layer of the matrix material and then another, another layer of uh, the metal material or the material for reinforcement. Okay. So the re reinforcement phase materials, uh, they are formed in the form of say fibers, long fibers, in the form of uh, particles or in the form of flakes. Now the matrix phase material is generally continuous. Examples uh, of composite uh, systems 
they can be your uh, uh, reinforced with the, your steel and epoxy reinforced uh, you can have uh, the graphite fiber also that can be your uh, the fiber reinforced material is there now based upon the geometry we can classify as uh, we can have particulate composite we can have flake composite or we can have fiber composite okay so if we will have small particles of any material and that is mixed with the epoxy to form a composite material so that type of material is known as a particulate composite material so if we have flakes or chunks of material uh, in terms of uh, say sheets uh, thin sheets so those flakes can be introduced of various shapes and sizes to form the uh, this composite material uh, mixed with your epoxy material and then fiber long threads of uh, metals they can be extracted uh, or actual we can use the fiber from the cloth also okay so uh, the if you might have heard heard of uh, the carbon fiber so we can use this carbon fiber sheet as a layer uh, in between two uh, say uh, the epoxy material uh, or to form a carbon fiber composite now based upon the type of matrix you might have the polymer matrix composites metal matrix composite okay and ceramic uh, matrix composite and carbon carbon composite we can use okay so if we are using a polymer material uh, in a matrix so we have a matrix matrix is common matrix is it can be any uh, any epoxy material that is a binder that binds uh, the different layers together so in between those layers if we use a polymer material that is a thermosetting plastic or a uh, thermoplastic material so then the composite formed is your pmc or polymer matrix composite if we are using metal uh, say flakes or metal fibers uh, in making the composite then the composite formed is your mmc or metal matrix composite if i using a ceramic material uh, in making the composite so the final product is your uh, cmc or a ceramic uh, matrix composite and if i are using fiber carbon so you can have a carbon carbon composite also so this is this is uh, the arrangement uh, or the final product uh, here so on top you can see the small particles are added uh, inside the main uh, matrix okay so this final product is your particulate composite if we are using flakes inside uh, to strengthen the material this is known as flake composite and if we are using strong long strings of fiber in between so the uh, if here you can see that it is a circular long fiber is there okay so that becomes your fiber reinforced composite so fiber composites consists of matrices reinforced by short discontinuous or long continuous fibers fibers are generally anisotropic uh, and examples include carbon and aramid okay so uh, where we, we use uh, resins uh, such as epoxy as the matrix material and in between we have uh, the layers of different fibers uh, and then we, what we have is a layer of epoxy material we have a layer of uh, the fiber material we have again a layer of epoxy material again a layer of fiber material and we go on uh, till uh, say five or 12 layers are there and then uh, that material is uh, put inside a press and it is pressed and then it is left for hardening after it is hard uh, and uh, the epoxy it uh, hardens uh, the final material it is in the form of a sheet and that sheet is your fiber reinforced composite metal matrix composite we use uh, the uh, metals uh, these metals are formed in the form of flakes or in the form of small fibers okay. and then in mmcs again we use uh, the uh, the various materials used are aluminium magnesium or titanium uh, are used okay so uh, the long fibers of carbon and silicon carbide are also used in this uh, forming the mmc materials okay. again we use a layer of epoxy material a layer of these uh, uh, fibers from the metals or flakes we use and these layers are repeated until the required uh, height or the uh, of the material is achieved so this is your metal matrix composites
Well, next type of materials are your smart materials. Now, smart materials are materials that uh, uh, can significantly alter one or more uh, of uh, the inherent properties owing to the application of some uh, uh, force or stimuli from outside in the controlled manner. Okay. So, smart materials uh, can uh, uh, say uh, actuate themselves under uh, the uh, under stress. Uh, under uh, the conditions of high temperature, under say moisture conditions, under varying uh, pH values, electric fields or magnetic fields. Okay. Now different types of uh, smart materials available. They can be piezoelectric materials. Uh, the input is the deformation. So if we deform or we press or compress uh, or we elongate this material, so what happens is a potential difference is created or electricity is produced. So this is the output of a piezoelectric material. Next is your electrostrictive uh, material. Is there electrostrictive material? If we provide as input the potential difference, the uh, this potential difference it uh, results in the deformation of the material. So the material either elongates or it uh, say uh, say it compresses. So this means piezoelectric and electrostrictive materials, they are uh, opposite to each other. Next is your magnetostrictive material. In this, what we provide input is the magnetic field and the output we get is the deformation of the material. So either it compresses or elong elongates. Then is your thermoelectric material. Thermoelectric material, as the name suggests, we input temperature and this temperature gets converted into potential difference or electricity. Next is your shape memory alloys. Shape memory alloys, uh, what uh, input is the temperature and the output is the deformation is there. Photochromic materials, if we input the radiation is provided onto the photochromic material, uh, the color of uh, that uh, uh, material, it changes color. Then is your thermochromic uh, material, the color of that material changes under temperature. So if we heat that uh, material, the color it changes. So these are the various types of materials. Now, if we look into these materials one by one, so we have a piezoelectric material. So what we do is we uh, apply force onto the material. Either the force can be compressive in the first diagram, or it can be, uh, say, tensile force is provided. So it, either it is compressed or it is elongated. So upon uh, provide, uh, applying this force, what happens is this material starts to develop electricity or it starts to produce electricity. So materials are quartz, uh, the Rochelle salt is there, topaz is there and the bismuth ferrite is there. So these materials, they are piezoelectric in nature. Then electrostrictive materials. Now in this, what we do is we, if we provide, say here, what we are doing is we are providing electricity. So by providing electricity, the deformation of the material it takes place. Right? So the main examples are lead, uh, lanthanum is there, zirconate, titanate is there, lead, magnesium is there, and niobate or PML is there. So these materials are electrostrictive materials. So next is your magnetostrictive materials. So these, uh, the change in their shape, uh, either they are get elongated or they get uh, thin or thick, uh, depending upon the magnetic field that is uh, applied. So under magnetic field, these uh, materials, they change their shape. So the examples are cobalt or terphenol D is there. These are the materials that are magnetostrictive materials. Then comes is your thermoelectric materials. Now these materials, when they are subjected to temperature difference, they start to produce electricity. Okay. So various uh, effects are there. That is Seebeck effect, Peltier effect, and Thomson effect are there by which the electricity is produced in these thermoelectric materials. Next is your shape memory alloys. Now, uh, these alloys, when uh, suppose we have an alloy or a material that is made up, uh, that is a shape memory alloy. Uh, and we change its shape okay, by twisting it. And then if we heat it up, 
at a certain temperature uh, it comes back to its original state so the various there are the two uh, phases that uh, we can talk of for that in which the transformation back to its original shape uh, uh, takes place is the austenite uh, that is high temperature phase and the martensite that is the low temperature phase so if we increase the temperature of that uh, alloy uh, it becomes the the shape becomes austenite the crystal structure becomes austenite okay and then when we increase the temperature it becomes martensite in its nature so here is an example of uh, the shape of memory alloy in effect so suppose we have given it a shape of this uh, uh, say sine wave now what we do is we change the shape manually and we change its shape now we place this material in hot water in hot water when it comes in contact with the temperature high temperature it comes back to its original shape that was given to it uh, electrically okay so this is your uh, shape memory alloy okay so under uh, uh, say uh, say physical uh, uh, deformation is given to that shape and then when that material is uh, heated to certain temperature it comes back to its original shape so these are your shape memory alloys now these shape memory alloys uh, the materials commonly used are your copper aluminum nickel iron manganese silicon uh, copper zinc uh, aluminum is there and nickel titanium is there the major applications are aircrafts orthopedic surgeries dental braces uh, and then is your Uh, in robotics we are using shape memory alloys uh, then is your what are chromogenic materials chromogenic materials what they do is they change their color in accordance to electrical thermal or radiative stimulation okay so there can be three types chromogenic either it is uh, thermochromic material it can be photochromic material or it can be electrochromic material so if we uh, provide the heat to a thermochromic material its color changes if we provide the radiation to that uh, certain material that is your photochromic material so the its color changes if we some uh, electrochromic material is there so if we provide a voltage difference potential difference the color of that material it changes so thermochromic material is uh, that material that changes its color under temperature uh, example is your vanadium oxide b2o5 uh, or is cholesterol nano noate is there nonane noate is there 1 2 3 uh, triazolol is there octa uh, d cy uh, d cyl phosphonic acid is there so all these are uh, used as uh, thermochromic materials so these are generally used in your inks dyes papers and plastic so this is an example of uh, on the right hand side you can see there is an example okay so uh, this can uh, it is uh, it has a uh, this color uh, on the side the line is there so under uh, changing temperature conditions uh, so the color here it is changed to purple so it can tell us that if the can is cold or hot okay certain inks or dyes are also used Uh, or certain papers or plastics are used uh, as thermochromic materials under various applications then is your photochromic material uh, that is under radiation it changes its light color uh, such materials are uh, so the transmittance of uh, light varies with the intensity of the incident light so various materials are uh, azobenzene uh, diethylene is there spiroferal is there ferran and then silver chloride is there so these are photochromic materials then photochromic materials they are used in your lenses in your uh, uh, super uh, supra molecular uh, chemistry is there dyes paints cosmetics and clothings even in toys uh, these materials are used uh, these materials are also used as your window uh, glass is there okay so when uh, in the during the daytime uh, when uh, the sunlight is there so that uh, what is that is it it uh, changes its color uh, and it becomes uh, darker so the sunlight uh, inside the room can be uh, prevented by that okay 
then is your electrochromic material this uh, material it changes its color under the effect of electricity okay so so here you can see an example and the bottom we have a material uh, under normal uh, conditions it is say pale yellow colored and when the electricity is supplied its color changes into dark uh, black color so small but voltage it changes it, it to opaque so initially it is uh, transparent it becomes opaque now these materials they are uh, the main ingredients or materials are your vanadium oxide in, uh, your nickel oxide is there titanium dioxide is there uh, then is your uh, poly any line is there uh, then is your polythiophene is there so these are used the applications are in your smart glasses that are your uh, eyewears light transmissive uh, devices or optical information and storage devices we use such material uh, rear view mirrors uh, during the night we use them and then is your protective eyewear uh, uh, is sometimes uh, you are given uh, eyewear after uh, if there is a uh, person who has just gone to an operation of the eye so those uh, eye glasses are made up of these electrochromic material now applications of smart materials they are used in your smart fabric smart aircraft uh, is there in aircrafts uh, sports goods is there uh, even your uh, sometimes your uh, smart dust uh, we create uh, out of these applications uh, reducing the vibration in helicopter blades uh, robotics medical surgery uh, security and many others are the examples of uh, these smart materials now various mechanical properties of uh, the materials uh, that are associated with any material uh, so major uh, the mechanical properties that are associated with uh, the materials they are strength uh, strength uh, can be again your three types is there tensile compressive or shear strength is there stiffness elasticity plasticity is there ductility malleability toughness brittleness hardness creep fatigue resilience machinability weldability and castability these are the various uh, properties of uh, any material okay so first we will take up the strength uh, it is defined as the ability of a material uh, to resist load without failure so without failing uh, it, it it can resist how much load it can resist that is the strength so first we have the tensile strength tensile strength is the ability to resist stretching so if we have a material and we start stretching it in opposite direction the uh, obviously elongation uh, will start to take place so the ability of a material to uh, resist the stretching is known as uh, tensile strength okay so uh, after how much uh, load uh, the device uh, or the material it breaks so that is the measure of its tensile strength next is the compressive strength it is the uh, ability of a material to resist uh, the compressive load or the squeezing okay next is shear strength the ability of a material to resist transverse load okay so transverse load means Uh, from top we are pushing the material on to the right hand direction and bottom we are push, uh, it is on stationary so if we are uh, applying uh, the force on a material uh, on one edge or top edge of a material so it becomes uh, shear uh, force and the ability to resist that force is known as shear strength stiffness it is the ability of a material to uh, resist deformation okay so if we have a steel bar and we try to bend it from one side or from both sides so stiffness is it is the ability of uh, any material to uh, deform or deflect that is the stiffness elasticity is if we deform a material and it comes back to its original shape that is elasticity plasticity is if we deform a material and it does not retain its original shape that is plastic material so elastic and plastic material <laughs> ductility is it is the ability of a material uh, that uh, uh, we can make uh, wires out of that material so that is ductility if we can make sheets out of a material that is malleability toughness uh, it is the ability of uh, the material to absorb energy 
before it fractures. Okay, so that is toughness. So if uh, you can see the, if you, you have seen the stress tin curve of a ductile material, so the area under that curve, it gives the toughness of that. So the more the tough the material, the more energy it can absorb. So under the stress tin curve, the area under the curve gives us the measure of the toughness of that material. Brittleness, it is uh, uh, the sudden fracture of a material uh, after uh, the elastic uh, limit is crossed. After the elastic limit of the material is crossed, uh, the sudden fracture of a material at that point is uh, known as brittleness. Uh, so the neck formation or the elongation of the material uh, is not, uh, it does not happen as in ductile material. So those materials are brittle materials. Hardness, it is the ability of a material to resist scratching or indentation. So we cannot dent a material. Uh, if, we are, if that material resists dent, indentation or dent on its surface, so it is a hard material. Creep, uh, it is a slow and progressive deformation of a material with time at a constant stress. Okay, so if we, if, if uh, uh, say some beam is there, it is under loading and uh, it is under constant stress. So after certain uh, time, say after say, uh, say years of application, uh, it, uh, that uh, beam, it, uh, fails okay so that is because of creep is there the effect is creep another failure is fatigue fatigue is uh, it is uh, uh, continuous uh, under or repeated uh, say stress uh, if we provide if a material is under repetitive stress okay or uh, you can say under uh, cyclic stress uh, and uh, that material, it fails after certain uh, cyclic uh, uh, stresses. So that is uh, the, that failure is known as fatigue. Okay. So machine parts uh, are frequently subjected to fatigue. So machine parts, because they are uh, uh, under continuous uh, loading and uh, unloading. Uh, so the stress is not continuous, it is cyclic stress. So the failure uh, that takes place is because of uh, fatigue is there. Next is resilience. It is the property of the material to absorb energy and to resist shock and impact loads. Okay. So shock and impact loads, how much shock or impact a material can withstand, that property is known as the resilience. So the, it is measured in terms of uh, energy absorbed per unit volume within the elastic limit that is resilience next is machinability the ease with which uh, a material can be worked or shaped uh, say by using a tool cutting tool okay the ease with which we can machine any object that property is known as machinability weldability it is the ease with which any metal can be or a material can be welded okay without changing in its uh, chemical uh, or other properties or physical properties. So that is weldability. Castability is how easily we can cast into different shapes. Okay, we can melt a material and then we can put it in a more different molds. So how easily it can be casted uh, under molten uh, conditions. So that is that property is known as the castability of the material. So this, this is all for uh, this uh, chapter and today's lecture.